Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, before we begin, as Elvia said, we're going to hear from the Young Girl Reading Group again. They're going to be reading from a book called God's Fires by Patricia Anthony, which I'll be referring to later in my talk. Um, Patricia Anthony uh, was a science fiction writer, or a, as they call it, a slipstream writer, where science fiction meets other genres of, of writing uh, in the 1990s, uh, specializing in first contact narratives, i.e. stories where humanity meets alien life forms for the first time. Um, I say was because she quit to become a Hollywood screenwriter, which is uh, literature's loss. Uh, her first book, Cold Allies, was about uh, aliens um, landing on Earth during World War III. Her second book, Brother Termite, was written from the point of view of the leader of a group of aliens who uh, take over and occupy America. Uh, but we're going to hear from her sixth book, God's Fires, which is about uh, when aliens crash land in Portugal in the 17th century during the Portuguese Inquisition, and uh, things don't end well. We're going to be hearing from uh, a, a section towards the end of the novel where the Inquisition has decided that everybody needs to burn. Um, just so that you can follow the section, um, some of the characters, there's Father Manuel Pessoa, who's a rational Jesuit, uh, who has argued against um, trying to uh, th this apocalyptic ending. Uh, there's Senora Teixeira, who's uh, a, a widow from the village. And like many of the other women, the outsider women of the village, uh, she is also being burnt along with the aliens, who are referred to as angels in the novel. Um, and then there's Afonso VI, who is the king of Portugal, uh, historically known for being uh, what we'd probably call uh, somebody with learning difficulties nowadays, but uh, at that time they just thought he was a bit mad. Uh, and in some ways he is mad, but he's also the sanest person in the book, arguably. Um, so uh, we'll commence, if you don't mind. Spiritu Sancti. Pessoa saw the king say something to his captain, saw the king bend down all about them, soldiers said, amen. Gomez walked in front, head bent, requiem purple, stole fluttering. Behind him came the executioners, even more frightening today, th three big men, faceless in their masks. As he walked, Pessoa took hold of Mar Maria Elena's hand, she smiled as if somewhere, either beyond or inside him, she had seen something beautiful. Maria Alina, Maria Alina, I inclined his head to, hear, to her, and in that one act, Pessoa banished all else. There were no soldiers, no executioners, no approaching pyres, just himself and the girl, her neat and the sunlight. Yes, father. He squeezed her fingers. Would you care to repudiate your sin and beg God's forgiveness? Would you like to do that now? Have a sin, Father. I have sin, Father. He leaned closer, so close that her hair tickled his cheek. She smelled off the San Benito's paint and off the straw she had lain in. Yes? I do not know what it is, Father, but still it cost me to lose my baby, and I'm very sorry for it all the same. He made the sign of the cross over her. I want you to say a God act of contrition now, Maria Elena, and in a little while when you are asked if you abjure, I want you to say that you have and have begged pardon and have asked me to in intercede in your, in your behalf. Do you understand? Behind him, Marta began to sob. He turned to see that she stopped. The entire procession had stopped there in the narrow street where the women had swept their porches and the litter gatherer had collected garbage. Gatherer has collected garbage for his pigs. Above them was a lace bordered window and pink geraniums with a single pallid face looking down. Little red footsteps trailed a path down the cobbles. Marta was sweeping. I can't, and inquisit inquisitorial guard pushed Jerem Castaneda back. Don't touch her. Another guard came, appraised Jerem's side, 
clapped his hand to his sword. Walk, walk, the first guard ordered. Mata said, her voice small, I can't. We will walk slower. The second guard told her, sit down for a while if you must. She could not manage that either. And so that guard helped her down the cobbles. He turned to Jiram. No one cares to see her cry, but there, there are rules, sir, and she must do it alone. We will walk if it takes all day, and if she must sit down every few meters, we will do that. Two guards stood by the two condemned, four altogether, the fourth station in which Jesus meets his mother, grant me a tender love. Suddenly, Tadeo was there, shoving both guards back. Emilio plucked the torches from out Marta's Jim and Jim's hands. God, where are, you, where are your hearts? Can you not let her father carry her? Marta was a small girl, no challenge to lift. Pessoa himself could have done it. Beyond the father with the daughter snuck in his arms stood the two creatures, swords holding their torches. Next stood Berenice, too hurtful to look at. The procession started up again. Pessoa walked quickly to catch Sonora Tixira. Maria Lina abjures, he said. She grunted. Good, for I would have asked her to if you hadn't, and she would have done. They rounded to the corner. Ahead were the pyres, a stark and pitch-laden plaque against the azure sky. I could leave now. Nothing held him. He could, he could walk away today, for tomorrow he surely would. It would best not to see this. It was best not to see this. Then he could live in England, happy, imagining that the message, message had come. The crooked smile on Sonora Texera's face surprised him. He, uh, we, have had, we have had our disputes, he said. She laughed. He said, low enough, he, uh, he said low enough so that neither executioner nor the mellow <laughs> could hear. But I beg you now, whatever hatred you harbor for God or for me, say that you abjure your sin and sincerely repent, for otherwise you will be burned to death in your daughter's sight. She said, hatred for you, Father Manol Inquisitor, Inquisitor. not any anymore, and no hatred special except for your manhood. All I regret is having to die first without watching you lose that prized dignity when you send your own bitch to the fire. Or will you even then? I care not that you burn, he hissed back. Not you, but when the flames touch flesh, you will scream, hell door open. Do you want your daughter to hear that? Do you? And then her having to climb the pyre herself, little understanding that she will not have to burn as well. It was uncanny that look as if she was inside him, saw the small mean thing Pessoa was, while her daughter had looked in, in him and seen grace. I will not scream, she said. I will lean into the fire and drink it, for it will taste better than this and smell better than you, and I will have a kinder ending than husband would ever give me. Afonso wanted to talk to the herbalist, for he quite liked her. He wanted to tell her that Yandira had burst her cocoon and was finally becoming, also he knew not what. The captain held him back. He would have spoken to the angels too, and wanted to tell them to take off their silly black robes. They could wear red like the pretty crimson footprints he had seen on the cobbles, or blue like the white sky, or green like the weeds which grew oftentimes between the walls of the houses in the cobbles, green. That was a happy color. It was a strange parade with the angels wandering and having to be herded, with the weeping man carrying the weeping girl, with the people in the window speaking between their curtains as if afraid to be seen and him not able to wave. But all of them, the fat priests, the executioners, the people dressed in black and flames, he was the most important one. So he walked importantly with his chest out and, and his chin up. 
Just outside the village was a meadow, all happy and green from the rain. And there were marigolds in plenty and late daisies, and large stacks of wood hats were nearly thrice the height of a man. Two of the stacks at the very end were tiny, angel-sized. There, in that meadow, the procession stopped, and the fat priest spoke, and the people who were in the silly black dresses that barely reached their knees all listened, and more of them were crying now. A soldier bought Afonso a chair, and the captain bade him sit down. Will it be long, he asked, a while, sir. Will we have dinner here, then? He thought a dinner on the grass might be pleasant, for the sun was warm and the breeze brisk, the meadow so pretty, and the daisies fresh-faced. The captain shook his head. No, look there, your majesty. See, this part is easy to watch, the effigies first. The little wood stack were not meant for angels, but for two straw figures which were quick to burst into flame. It is almost carefully planned. They set the easternmost one first, sir, the captain said, for the afternoon wind is west to east. Afonso watched the wind plug at the straw men and carry bright pieces of them away. I see, Father de Melo. All the priests were standing about a woman who should not have been dressed in the short shift at all. Her legs were knobby in some places and fat in others and her hair had come loose from her bun and stuck up on her head in a fright. Do not wave, sir. Father is buzzy. Now, when the pyre is lit, you may hold onto my hand, if you wish. But do not rise up out of your chair, nor should you make any outcry, nor a protest of any sort. If you feel the need to vomit, do so to the side there. The woman was angry and shouting. Those priests should stand back, Alonso said, for she seemed very furious. A masked executioner came to help her, his stack of the wood, but she slept at him. She hiked her skirt above her skinny shanks and woke up by herself. All the priests below were waving their crosses, waving their crosses, and her laughing down. The executioner tied her about the stake, hands and legs, and then he left her, and she was all alone there, shouting. The priests hushed their prayers, and Afonso could hear what she said. All men murdered, for I look down and see not a woman among you, cock proud, cock stupid. You had best fear me, hadn't you? Hadn't you? And do not dare sleep, for I'll come tonight in your dream and suck the life out from between your legs. Afonso told the captain, I like her, she is funny, and she reminds me of Jandira. On the other side of the woods, the executioner was setting the wood alight. He raced to the front and set that a fire too. Afonso saw the woman look down once before the tender coat. Thank you very much. I think they deserve it. I'm going to talk a little bit about Patricia Anthony later. I'm going to start with trying to grapple towards what the new weird is. Um, there's a series of, of texts beginning to sort of coalesce into a canon uh, about the new weird, um, primarily around the Vandermeers who Ali has spoken about already and especially their collection, The New Weird, um, but also uh, people like China Mieville, especially his, uh, his three novels set in his Baslag universe, uh, especially the first one, Perdido Street Station, um, Justina Robson's Quantum Gravity series with its embedded micro-universes, uh, the fiction of Jeff Noon, uh, which involves uh, linguistic playfulness and, and drug realities, um, Steph Swainston's Castle series. There's many of these. Um, but what we can say about the new weird is it's a 20th, 21st century phenomenon. Uh, it involves fantastical narratives, i.e. non-realistic, non-mimetic narratives, which defy conventional genre definitions. They have elements of science fiction within them, they have elements of fantasy within them, but as Elvia has pointed out earlier, they do not fit easily into any of these established genres, and they move and slide porously between them all. Um, 
But if we're saying that it's new weird, as Ali pointed out, that implies an old weird. And the old weird, as Ali also pointed out, uh, dates from the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and it features a, a number of elements which have transmigrated across time into the new weird. Um, fundamentally, it deals with outsideness. Um, the, that, that phenomenon Ali was talking about where um, you perceive yourself from the outside, you find yourself suddenly thrust to the outside. Uh, what seemed inside is suddenly outside. Um, it also, um, I mean this comes from, from H.P. Lovecraft's uh, essay, Notes on Writing, on Writing Weird Fiction from 1937, where he describes wanting to break the prison house of the known by way of shattered natural law or cosmic alienage or outsideness. Um, so this idea that um, there, there's an alienness in everything that we, we will find ourselves suddenly thrust into when we become outside. Um, the old weird also has a curious relationship with the sublime, the, the Burkean sublime defined by Edmund Burke. Uh, that sense of, of, of awe, but also terror when you encounter natural phenomena like the Alps, um, which migrated into a more technological sublime in the 19th and 20th centuries with the invention of things like electric lighting, uh, massive dams, uh, rockets that go into space. These are all examples of the technological sublime. We, we find them uh, awe-inspiring, but also a little frightening. Um, and so there's a component of the sublime. And, and fundamentally, as Burke points out, the sublime is unknowable. We can't truly know it. Uh, it's, a, it's an effective feeling within ourselves. Um, a lot of the weird fiction writers of the era that Ali was talking about in the early 20th century, the modernist era, um, drew inspiration from a, a previous generation, people like Edgar Allan Poe, obviously, but also a Welsh writer called Arthur Macken. And Arthur Macken uh, wrote these very weird horror stories in the, in the late 19th century. And he borrowed the term perichoresis to describe what was going on uh, in his fictions. And, and this is a theological term that comes from Christianity. It, 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 it describes the relationship in the Christian Trinity, uh, the Holy Trinity, um, which is somehow simultaneously godlike, but also simultaneously human. How can it be both? That, that seems like a tension. But that tension uh, of, of something being uh, divine or cosmic in scope, but also human in experience, uh, was something that he was trying to achieve in his weird fiction. Um, and ultimately, all of these old weird fictional texts are liminal. They constantly move back and forth between different uh, genre forms, between different levels of ontology or reality as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about an earlier precursor again, um, which is the 14th century. Um, the 14th century was not a happy time for Western Europe, uh, and specifically not for England and France. Um, up to 60% of Europe's population died as a result of the Black Death, uh, the, 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 the plague carried by rats, fleas uh, across Western Europe. Um, and at the same time, because political leaders are rarely wise, um, England and France decided to go and have a massive war that is now known as the Hundred Years' War. Uh, so during this period of, of apocalyptic experience, of, of chiliastic encounter, um, we, we have a reaction, a literary reaction, in, in both France and in England, but primarily in England, where people start writing dream narratives. Um, and dreaming is an enormous component of how they try to respond to the horrible realities that they were encountering. Um, partly because it's a way of getting away, you know, the, the, the aspirational component of dreaming, trying to dream, to have a dream of a better world, but also because they were seeing dreams everywhere. Um, they were seeing the nightmares of reality that was unfolding before them, but also the Black Death would cause people to have fever dreams. They would fall into feverish dreams where they would ramble incoherently about uh, visions that they, were not real before ultimately succumbing to the death. Um, so there's a large amount of these precursors going all the way back to Plato's cave. I'm not going to run through all of these, but obviously uh, biblical and classical precursors. And there was also a couple of precursors in, in terms of French literature uh, between the 12th and 13th centuries looking at um, 
uh, narratives which were embedded within dreams. And, and when you embed a narrative within a dream, you do a bunch of different things. Firstly, you can render something unreal, but secondly, you can render it deniable. So if you want to say things that you can't say in normal texts, if you want to uh, challenge authority or, or, or discuss heresy, you can, you can do it in a dream, but not elsewhere. Um, so we have this large number of dream poems in the 14th century. Um, the, the two late ones, uh, Froissart and Damasio in France, were clearly being influenced by uh, dream literature that emerged from the mid-14th century in England first. Uh, Mon in the Moon, I, The Man in the Moon, um, which is early 14th century. The, the Pearl poem um, from the mid-14th century is a, a, a classic example of this. Um, this is where uh, the poet has lost his two-year-old daughter uh, and falls asleep next to a river and meets her, now transformed into an adult, uh, and she guides him through the universe. Um, Pierce Plowman, um, which was uh, written by the same author as Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which also has a dream state in it, and a lot of Geoffrey Chaucer's work. Um, the House of Fame, in particular, the Nun's Priest Tale from the Canterbury Tales, uh, leading up to ultimately by 1390, John Gower is satirizing this. It's become such a, a, a stereotypical genre of fiction, the dream poem, that he's able to even satirize it in, in 1390. Um, and there are specific attributes of this dream poem that render it satirizable, that, that have solidified and become concrete. Um, it's fundamentally non realist. Uh, it's often uh, introduced by anguished life circumstances, such as the death of a loved one in the Pearl poem. Uh, and after experiencing this anguish, the dreamer goes to a garden and f or a glade or a river or a forest and he falls asleep. It's always a he. Uh, and, it, and in the dream, the dreamer is guided by a figure of authority. So we can see the influence of these poems on things like Dante, for example. Um, and they then might be treated to a vision of heaven or guided by allegorical figures around the universe. Um, and uh, you know, the dream is fundamentally populated by fantastical creatures and impossible events. Time gets warped, space gets warped. Um, but uh, it, it's therefore a liminal space. It's commenting on the dreamer's reality without being of that reality. Um, it's also a social critique and commentary, because as I say, you can embed that within a dream without attracting the negative attention of the authorities. Um, dreams are deniable, so you can criticize the church or you can criticize political leaders therein. Um, and also you can criticize social and economic circumstances that are going on in the world at the time as well, because it's just a dream. Um, and, and because of that dream usefulness, um, the, the ability to incorporate critiques. Uh, dream continued to haunt proto-science fiction ever since. There's a long list here from Kepler's Somnium uh, all the way down to the 1920s through the works of people like Mary Shelley, uh, all the explosion of late 19th century utopias where people fall asleep and dream of a utopian world 100 or 200 or 400 years hence. Um, through the work of H.G. Wells. And finally, you get David Lindsay's very weird and allegorical voyage to Arcturus, which I would characterize as weird fiction. Um, after that point, uh, something interesting has happened to dreams. Um, they've been vivisected by Sigmund Freud. Uh, he, he's created a role for dream within science in terms of psychoanalysis. So dream at that point migrates away from science fiction and into weird fiction. Now, in the old weird, things often seem dreamlike, uh, but they're not presented as dreams. They're, they're not even presented as nightmares, although they are very definitely nightmarish. Um, in H.P. Lovecraft's Pulp Fiction, we have this idea that reality is just a thin veneer um, that's masking a, a reality which is impossible to contemplate without risking or achieving madness. In other words, there's a, a completely different, very nightmarish ontology just waiting to explode out of it. And this was related to Lovecraft's cosmicism, uh, which again had been influenced by Arthur Macken, um, which, which suggests that our reality is a kind of dream that we collectively inhabit. And beyond this dream on the outside is something much weirder, much more horrific and much more threatening. Um, Donna Haraway has borrowed this kind of idea to discuss um, our current era, which is often described as Anthropocene, uh, because, to, to evoke the idea that man is changing our climate. Um, she uses the term the Cthulhu scene, 
uh, to describe our current era, quote, which entangles myriad temporalities and spatialities and myriad interactive entities in assemblages, including the more than human, other than human, inhuman, and human as hummus or soil. Um, to move sideways from science fiction, um, fantasy literature also features dream quite significantly, but very often in very negative ways. Um, of three examples here, we have Tiffany Aching from Terry Pratchett's Discworld series, who becomes trapped in the dream of the drones. Um, we have Rillian from C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, who is trapped in the dream of the Lady of the Green Kirtle in The Silver Chair. And of course, uh, we have Harry Potter, who becomes trapped in the dreams of the evil Lord Voldemort in J.K. Rowling's Wizarding series of novels. So perhaps because fantasy literature itself is dreamlike, it doesn't have to, uh, to obey the laws of science and physics the way science fiction claims to do. Um, it is therefore dreamlike itself. It therefore needs to be negative about dreaming within it. Um, so when we come to look at the new weird, we start seeing some of these things come together. Dreaming and nightmares feature very, very heavily in the new weird. Um, in China Mieville's Perdido Street Station, we have the, the slake moths, which is the, those, that illustration on the left, who feed on dreams. Um, we have Neil Gaiman's uh, cult graphic novel series, The Sandman, whose uh, eponymous allegorical figure, uh, Morpheus, literally is Lord of Dream. Um, we have the sense that reality is becoming a nightmare in Annihilation and the rest of Jeff Vandermeer's Southern Reach trilogy. In Steph Swainson's Castle series, Jant the Messenger, the protagonist, constantly falls into drug-induced uh, dream states where he visits a different reality called The Shift. Um, and, and all of the sort of drug hallucination realities that exist in Jeff Noon's novels, all of these have dream and nightmare qualities about them. Um, to come back to, Pat to Patricia Anthony, um, first contact is also weird. Um, it's a recurring trope, especially in science fiction, the idea of um, our first encounter with an alien. We are a lonely species, at least since we killed off the Neanderthals, our fellow hominids. Um, we are a lonely species and we yearn, but are also frightened by the idea that we might encounter another sentient species. Um, so therefore, first contact is both dream, such as with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or nightmare, as in most Hollywood movies about when we first encounter aliens. Um, because aliens are the other, they're the ultimate other. And, and this both uh, locates us and pins us down in terms of our potentiality in the universe and also frightens us. So to try and understand the alien is it to try and understand the incomprehensible, uh, the thing that is not like us. Um, and, and, and encounters with the alien are therefore liminal. It, they're, they're bounded by our reality and their reality. However, that's, uh, that's manifest. And hence, of course, because that has not happened yet, uh, such narratives are fantastical. Um, and they also function very usefully as social and economic critique because aliens hold up mirrors to us. Um, in God's fires, um, the aliens who are perpetually silent. They never speak, they have no voice. They land in uh, 17th century Portugal and they're immediately used by everybody to explain weird things that has been, have been going on. People becoming pregnant, um, you know, uh, cattle roaming loose. And suddenly the, that attracts the attention of the Inquisition who have a very rigid and narrow idea of reality. And so the Inquisition descend and decide to punish people for diverting away from their rigid, narrow reality. And they do so by picking on the usual suspects. Obviously, they burn the aliens because the aliens are the in instigators and the, cat the catalysts of this. But they also burn the outsider women of the village, the, uh, the girl who's fallen pregnant outside of marriage, um, the herbalist in the forest, uh, the, the, the slightly crazy old lady uh, who's a widow. Um, and, and therefore, what Patricia Anthony is doing here with this first contact narrative is, is, is showing us the social and economic critique of Portugal in the Inquisition era. Um, another book I'd like to highlight in this genre is Eiffelheim by Michael Flynn, partly because I'm here in Germany and partly because this book is set in 14th century Germany, again at the time of the Black Death arriving, where uh, a, a, 
a, a student of Thomas Aquinas attempts to forge an uneasy alliance with, again, a crash-landed sentient alien species. But again, um, with the eruption of the Black Death, this is uh, immediately associated with the aliens and it ends very apocalyptically. Um, and I want to suggest, therefore, that the era that we're in now is another 14th century. It's another apocalyptic era, and the fiction that it's generating, which is climate fiction, is therefore uh, another form of new weird fiction, because the world that we find ourselves is liminal. We're caught on the cusp of uh, the petrol and oil-enabled past that we have been inhabiting for such a long time, and the future which is not going to be the same because we're going to run out of oil or we're going to run out of functioning air and climate. Um, our world is also perichoretic. We are like gods in this world compared to any other era. Um, the technology that we have, the ability to grow food in abundance, the ability to share knowledge almost instantaneously around the world makes us like gods, but we're also desperately human. And we're gonna find that out once our climate starts entering uh, a collapse. Um, therefore, our reality, such as it is right now, is stretched over uh, a much more nightmarish and horrific reality that we're about to find manifest life, in other words, is going to become weird. Um, there is a risk of madness in comprehending this. Some people who are climatologists find themselves uh, expressing uh, frustration to the point of depression, trying to scream at the planet, uh, we need to change, and yet uh, the planet does not change. Um, climate fiction, therefore, is absolutely fundamentally our era's social and economic literary critique. Um, it is literature's attempt to scream stop to the planet. And maybe what we actually need is a first contact with our own alien other. We need to start understanding who we are going to be and become in the post-oil era, in the era of climate collapse, in the era of melting glaciers, in the era of, of, of species extinction. Maybe we need to meet who we are going to be in order to understand how to move through this transient period. Um, so therefore, my argument is, um, Kim Stanley Robinson once said, that's, that's his climate fiction book there, um, New York 2140, in which um, society, uh, New York has, has been flooded. So, so high society and money has moved to Denver. And, and New York becomes like a weird, uh, you know, uh, collective space for all the dropouts and all the outsiders to come together and try to create a kind of anarchic utopia therein. And he, he famously said, um, maybe, we're all living in a science fiction novel that we're collectively writing. Well, I would say maybe we're living in a weird fiction novel that we're collectively creating. Um, and this new weird is actually the same as the old weird, which is actually the same as the very old Fantastica indeed from the 14th century, uh, which is our collective fever dream. Thank you very much. <laughs>